Good morning. How's everyone doing? I just want to thank everyone for their prayers for my recent trip to Texas. Um, your prayers were appreciated, and I know they were answered. Um, when Rosalind and I came out, we had this horrific storm that uh, we had to pull over and let it pass through because there was no visibility. This time, we didn't have any uh, storm-related incidents, but we did have one incident that was man-made, and I just want to share this because God is good. Um, we were in New Mexico, and they're still building out, I guess, the highway so that you go through spots where it's two lanes and it goes down to one lane. Uh, you don't want to be behind a truck when it's one lane, right? So... I saw the sign said uh, road construction in one mile. I'm like, okay, I don't want to be behind the truck. And then this guy just zoomed out. So I figured I'll just follow this guy and then we'll both pass the truck, right? So around the bend, boom, there's two New Mexico police officers just, just sitting right there. And I'm like, okay, let me just take my foot off the gas and maybe he won't recognize that I've been speeding. So the first officer pulled the guy who was in the front over. I was like, whew, we made it. Then here comes the second officer right behind me. Pulled over. He says, how you doing, sir? Oh, uh, I'm fine, officer. How are you? Uh, where are you heading to so fast? Well, I'm trying to get my daughter moved down to Texas. And uh, he said, you know you were doing 90 and a 75? I'm like, uh, yeah, officer, I, I think I was speeding. So, you know, you know the drill, license, registration. Uh, I gave him my license. Registration is in Rosna's name. And she had been asleep, so she's waking up to an officer standing right there. Uh, gave him all the paperwork. He went back to the car. And I'm like, Lord, okay. I know I was wrong, but oh. Because when you're 15 miles over the speed limit, what's that, Keith? Reckless endangerment. Yeah, so, you know, you get a speeding ticket on top of reckless endangerment. But anyway, the guy came back. He was a young guy. Uh, he said, you know, I'm just going to let you off with a warning. I understand you're trying to move your child, so uh, you, you need to keep your foot off that pedal. And I was like, Lord, oh, God, thank you for the prayers. Thank you for the prayers. But other than that, we had no problem. We got down there, rainy, but she's in her place and she's good, amen? So that's what parents do. Parents are always looking out for their kids, amen? And I wanted to say that because today's PSA is a story of that. It comes from Laoqing City, China. The abduction of two-year-old Guo Zingxian in eastern China in 1997 sparked a desperate, seemingly never-ending nationwide search by his parents that inspired filmmakers to bring their story to the big screen. But this week, 24 years after his disappearance, the search for Guo finally came to an end. Police in Liaoqing City, Shandong Province, said Monday that they had found Guo, now an adult living in neighborhood Henan Province, and had reunited him with his parents. Video footage of the reunion on Sunday released by police shows the family in tears, embracing tightly, crying out, we found you, you come back. Police said they had arrested two people who confessed to kidnapping and trafficking Ghoul. Ghoul had been abducted near his home by an unfamiliar woman his parents told police in 1997. Authorities collected blood, DNA samples, and other evidence, but with limited technology at the time, the case remained unsolved, the police said on their official social media account on Tuesday. The case was never closed, and police say they continued investigating throughout the 24 years. Gould's father, Gould Gangtang, never stopped looking either. After his son went missing, he embarked on a search across China, riding a motorbike through nearly all of the vast country's provinces covering 500,000 kilometers, according to the state-run news agency. He carried little with him except a bag full of flyers, a flag emblazoned with a picture of his son. He used up all his savings and racked up staggering debts, burning through 10 motorcycles 
on its long journey. His search gained national attention when it inspired the 200, excuse me, 2015 movie Lost in Love, starring Hong Kong actor Andy Lau. He couldn't find his son, but he managed to help track down more than 100 other abducted children and reunite them with their families, according to Zhenghua. He never gave up. This year's authorities hit upon a new lead using the technology, DNA analysis, and facial feature comparison, and they found a potential match in Hina. And when officers tracked the man down, DNA testing confirmed that it was the missing Guo Zinching. Amen. 24 years, and he never stopped looking. Um, I didn't see the movie, but on this page where the story was, they had clips of the movie, and it, you just see the guy riding a motorcycle going from place to place looking for his son, and he, and he just never gave up. And uh, the people who made the movie helped pay off some of the debts from all the money he racked up going through all these different motorcycles and whatever. But uh, as Mike just mentioned, so as the father Loves me, I love you, right? Father's love, he, he just never stops. And that's how God is. God is never going to stop searching for the lost sheep. No matter what it takes, if God is for you, he's going to find you, and he's going to save you. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get into today's message. Look. Lord, we thank you once again for another time today. We praise you, Father, for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace, Lord. And we ask you to meet us here at this place, at this time, at this hour. Lord, speak to us through your word today, Lord. Enrich us with knowledge, knowledge wisdom, and understanding, Lord, so that we would leave this place better than whence we came. We thank you, and we praise you, and that everyone who agrees say, Amen. Amen. All right, we're finally going to finish this series on Abimelech. Title of today's message, without surprise, is TikTok Abimelech, right? TikTok Abimelech. And for those of you who are savvy with slang, you know when someone says TikTok, TikTok, that means your time is up, right? TikTok Abimelech. I'm going to be reading from Judges chapter 9, verses 50 to 57. And the Bible says, Then Abimelech went to Thebes and encamped against Thebes and captured it. But there was a strong tower within the city, and all the men and women and all the leaders of the city fled to it and shut themselves in. And they went up to the roof of the tower. And Abimelech came to the tower and fought against it and drew near to the door of the tower to burn it with fire. And a certain woman threw an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. Then he called quickly to the young man, his armor bearer, and said to him, Draw your sword and kill me, lest they say of me, a woman killed him. And his young man thrust him through, and he died. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, everyone departed to his house. Thus God returned the evil of Abimelech, which he committed against his father in killing his 70 brothers. And God also made all the evil of the men of Shechem return on their heads. And upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubbabel. Amen. So, we see that Abimelech finally met his end, right? And the thing that I found interesting about how he met his end was, you remember from last week, he killed all the people in Shechem, right? First he got rid of the rebellion with Gael, and then the next day, he just attacked all the people. So there's no one left, and he raised the city, right? So now he's a king without a kingdom, right? Because he killed all the subjects. So rather than start over, he went to a neighboring town and tried to suppress and overtake that town, right? And this is how he met his end, because... He thought he could use the same battle plan that he used in Shechem, but the people in their tower had rocks to throw down, and a woman threw down a millstone and cracked his skull, 
right? So obviously, for Abimelech, which is the first point, this was the wrong move, right? Attacking a city that had nothing to do with anything you're doing was obviously the wrong move. But I think, personally, in his quest for power, being a king without a kingdom, he felt he had to take over some place and have people serve him. But that was obviously the wrong move because that resulted in his death. Amen? The Proverbs 14.12 says this. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. And that is so true here in this passage because he felt attacking an innocent city was the right way to go. But the end of that decision was his death, right? And sometimes we are that way. Sometimes we do things that we know we shouldn't, like doing 90 in a 75. But thankfully, God had mercy that I didn't end in my death. But still, it's not like I didn't know. The odometer is right there in my face. You know, the speed limit in New Mexico is 75, which is generous enough. So I should already know, okay, well, I see it creeping towards 80. I should just dial it back, right? But, you know, I felt, hey, I don't want to be behind the truck because there's no visibility. <sighs> that was the wrong move. For Abimelech, this was the wrong move because that town had nothing to do with any of your mess. And now you're going to attack these innocent people. And God don't like ugly, right? So, you know, let all of us, let, let all of us be mindful of the fact that sometimes what we think is the right move may not be the right move, which is why in Proverbs twelve fifteen it says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice, right? You know, if you... Surround yourself with good people. Good people will tell you when they think you're making a mistake. Because your friendship with them can endure differences. Right? I noticed as I went back through this entire chapter about Abimelech, not once did he take counsel from anyone. In fact, the only time he spoke to people was to tell them, do what I'm doing. Go cut down some branches like I just did, and then let's just blow up this city, right? He never listened to anyone's counsel, which, according to the Bible, makes him a fool. Because, it says right here, a wise man listens to advice. And what that means is, you're trying to get a different point of view, another perspective. You, you don't just want to always go with what you think is right. Because sometimes another person may be able to see something that you don't see. And that's the way it's supposed to be. The Bible also says there is safety in a multitude of counselors. So when you take advice from others, you're basically protecting yourself. You know, they may agree with you and say, yeah, that's the right move. But if they don't, then maybe you should take a step back and say, well, let me think about this, right? I was reading um, the other day about how the, the cabinet, the presidential cabinet is supposed to work, right? And what it is, you have all these people who are experts in their field but when a major decision is made, you bring the whole cabinet together and everyone discusses the decision because that way you get a multitude of different perspectives. And when you don't listen to your own cabinet, your own counselors that usually God puts in place for you, you might be making a big mistake, right? The one thing I appreciate about our little church is that in the leadership, we, no one person decides. We all have to agree, right? And sometimes that's not easy, 
But we don't move forward unless we all agree this is what we're going to do, right? I can't be mad at Norma if she's the holdout and then put pressure on my, hey, man, talk to your wife. Tell her to change her mind. Because, you know, Norma might be the one person where God said, no, this is not the right way to go. Not the right way to go, right? So you, you, you have to listen to advice from others. That's just good sense, common sense. Godly wisdom, right? And Proverbs 15.22 says, Without counsel, purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors they are established. Without listening to others, what you are trying to do may come to ruin and failure. That's what that verse is saying. But when you listen to different and many people, hopefully godly people, they are established, right? You don't want to spend your life making wrong move after wrong move after wrong move. What you really want to do is, in your life, make the right move and the right move and the right move. Because when you make the right move over and over, you get all God's blessings, right? But when you keep making the wrong move over and over, Your head starts having nuggets right here on the forehead because you keep running into the wall when you can avoid the wall. You know, a friend would tell you, hey, you're about to hit the wall. Just make a left turn and then make an immediate right turn and you'll be scot-free. No, I'm going to do it my way. Bang! What happened? Well, you didn't listen to me, man. I told you, man, the wall was right there. I told you. And that's what happens with a lot of us in life. We don't want to listen to the very person that God put in our lives to keep us from making mistakes. You know, the Bible says that Eve was a help meet for Adam. Meat being suitable, appropriate, right? And she's supposed to help Adam make better decisions. Although her first time out, she made the wrong decision. She said, hey, this apple is good. Here, have some. Right? But other than that, you know, we're thousands of years removed from that now, praise God. So for the married people, especially you husbands, God has given you that wife to be your best counselor because no one knows you as well as your wife. She knows the good and the bad and the ugly, so you don't have to try to hide it from her because she knows. And when she gives you advice, it's because she wants what's best for you. Because she knows what's best for you is best for her. Right? So when our wives say, hey, I, I'm not sure that's the right decision, we should stop and sit down and think. Right? I know my wife probably knows me better than myself. Because I notice all these little things she does around the house to make my life easier. Right? Don't say anything. She just goes around, do it. Right? And then the little things that I like, like the frozen popsicles, she'll get them. Right? Because she wants me to be okay. So I'm not going to risk making a wrong move by not listening to my wife. I'm going to always take her counsel. And if her counsel is what I don't like, then I'll ask Mike to bring some oil and we'll lay hands. Right? Oh, come on. Listen to the counsel that God provides for you. He provides it in the Bible. He provides it through the friends that he surrounded us with. And if you're married, he, he gives it to you to your spouse. Listen to your spouse. Amen? All right. Point two. Tick-tock, Abimelech. Tick-tock. Time's up. You had three good years to get it together, obviously, you chose not to. So, what happens when your time is up? I'm glad you asked. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We all have that appointment waiting for us, right? So that you will receive 
get just compensation. Right? If you spent your whole life doing evil and trying to be slick, you should not expect to receive blessings from the hand of God. Right? What did he say to the sheep and the goat? Lord, when did we do this to you? When did we see you? If you done it unto the least of these, you done it unto me. And if you didn't do it to the least of them, well, obviously you didn't do it to God, right? It says right here, we must all, that means every single person, including Abimelech, we all have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There's no slide ticket that you can use to get out of that. Amen? So if you want to receive blessings from God for what you have done while you lived here on earth, then you need to start correcting your actions now and make sure whatever it is that you're doing lines up with the Bible says what we should be doing. And if you're not sure about what should we be doing to get blessings from God, I'm going to break it down for you real simple. One, love God. Two, love your neighbor as yourself. If you do those two things, you'll be doing all right. Because if you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to steal from your neighbor. You're not going to attack your neighbor. You're not going to cover whatever it is that your neighbor has. You're not going to do any of those things because you're considering that person just as you would consider yourself. And you wouldn't want it done to you, so you're not going to do it to anybody else. If you do those two things, if you love God, and I don't mean love in a superficial way. You know, like, oh, baby, you know I love you. Baby, baby, you know I love you. But you're never there when I need you. How can you say you love me and you're never there, right? Loving God means obeying his word, applying his word to your life, sharing his word with others. That's how you love God. It's, it's not words. It's action. Amen? And two, loving your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said in the gospel that all the law and the prophets hinder on those two things. Loving God, love your neighbor as yourself. So, Abimelech, your time's up. What did you do with the time you had? Did you love God? Obviously you didn't because you killed all your brothers in one stroke, right? Then you killed the people of Shechem, right? You didn't love your neighbor as yourself either. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 24 says this. The sins of some people are conspicuous going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. And what that verse is saying is that it's obvious that some people are just outright sinners, right? It's obvious. Dude, you killed all your brothers, right? The Bible says do not kill. So you're obviously in opposition to what God is saying. And I don't know what else you did, but I know that sin is going ahead of you. And the other things that you did that no one else saw, God's going to bring them out later when he has his judgment. Right? So don't think you can be slick and get away with what God sees. Amen? When your time is up, you can't go back and fix it because everything has already been put in place. Right? Like the ten virgins. Five were wise and they had their oil ready to go. The other five said, hey, loan us. Said, no, you need to go to the market and get your own. Right? But when they came back, hey, open up, it's us. I don't know you. I don't know you. And I'm sure that's what Abimelech heard when he said, but God, I was trying to, I don't know you, bro. You're a murderer and you're a thief. So now you're going to get your just reward. And just in case you think that this didn't happen as it should have been, Hebrews 9.27 says this, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, after that comes the judgment. Boom. We have this one shot. You know, this, is, this is not like 
you know, a movie where we can try a plan and say, okay, that didn't work, let's try this, let's try plan B. You only have one life, one plan A. And the time you have to get it right is the time that God has been given to you, that God has given you. So if you want your life to be blessed, and you know that once you leave here, the judgment is coming, then just do right. Right? Because what does it say about the fruit of the Spirit? Against such things, there is no law. Kindness, patience, right? Long-suffering, all those things, there's no law. No one's going to arrest you for being nice. No one's going to arrest you for being long-suffering. There's no law against the fruit of the Spirit. And if you let the fruit just permeate through your life, when it's time for you to face the judgment, you're going to be in good shape. Amen? All right, point three. God will always have the last word. Always. Some people think that they have the last word, but God is the final authority. Amen? So to wrap this up, in Judges chapter 9, verse 19 and 20, Jotham, this was his last word. He said, if you have acted in good faith and integrity with Jerubbabel and with his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out from Abimelech and devour the leaders of Shechem and Beth Milo, and let fire come out from the leaders of Shechem and from Beth Milo and devour Abimelech. That was his last word, his curse to his brother, because he said, hey, man, you haven't done right, and you know you haven't done right, right? And God's going to be the judge, because if you have done right, no problem. God's going to bless you, but you haven't done right, mutual fire, right? In the nuclear age, they call it mutually assured destruction because I launch nukes, you launch nukes, and we both end up killing each other, right? Abimelech's last words, and a certain woman threw an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. Then he called quickly to the young man, his armor bearer, and said to him, draw your sword and kill me, lest they say of me, a woman killed him. And his young man thrust him through and he died. And here's the thing, look at this. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, everyone departed to his home. Right? There was no great mourning for him. Everyone just left. Oh, he's dead. Well, okay, let's just go. Right? You would think at least the people who were with him, who had been through all those battles, would at least, you know, shed one tear. But every man went to his home. And his last word didn't even matter because it doesn't matter if a woman kills you, bro. You got a horrible judgment waiting for you because of all the stuff you did in your life. And finally, in Judges chapter 9, verses 56 and 57, God says, God returned the evil of Abimelech which he committed against his father in killing his 70 brothers. And God also made the evil of the men of Shechem return on their heads, and upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubbabel. So, God, the great God, the only true and wise God, he had the final word, and he said everything straight, just like he always does. We may not have seen it, especially since we said, Lord, it's been three years. You going to let this guy keep doing what he's doing? But God said it all straight. And that's what he'll do in your life if you let him. But don't try to be slick and think you're going to get away like I was. Oh, if I just follow behind this car in his slipstream, no one will know that I'm doing 90, right? But they found me out. And as the Bible says, your sin will find you out too. So the easiest way to avoid that is just don't do it. Don't, don't say it. When you know someone has told you, hey, this is a bad idea. This is a bad idea. Or what, what are they? I have a bad feeling about this. Huh? Maybe we should listen to those feelings with someone. I have a bad feeling about this. I don't think it's this, this is the way to go. I don't think this is it. So let me close it out with this, short and sweet. What did you learn? 
We've had several sermons about Abimelech, this whole little history. What did you learn that you can apply to yourself, that you can apply to your own life? Let me give you a little hint. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 5 and 6, Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. That passage was talking about the children of Israel in the wilderness, right? But it also applies to us today because none of us should want something so badly that we were willing to kill for it, like Abimelech did. Who knows? If he would have talked to his brothers, maybe they would have said, you know what, go ahead, man. I'm good with the life I have here. I don't even want to be king. I just want to eat, drink, and be merry, right? But this example of a man consumed by wanting power so badly that he would kill his own brothers is an example for us. It's a warning for us. Don't do it. Nancy Reagan said, just say no. Don't don't do it. Just say no. Right? So you don't desire evil as he did. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father,